How dare you, Mr. Clinton said to the collective. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jim Cecil, here to welcome you. Thank you for intending, attending Justice Pro Se's May 19th, 1995 public meeting. How dare you, Mr. Clinton says to you, the collective. I have a statement from Justice Pro Se that I would like to give at this time. Justice Pro Se of Michigan considers the April 19th bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City to be a senseless act of violence as were the attacks on the church and home at Waco, the home of the Weaver family, the home of the Scott family, and the home of the Leekend family. We send our heartfelt condolences to the families and friends of all the victims of these terrible events. Our hope is that the individuals responsible for these heinous acts are captured, tried, convicted, and appropriately sentenced. Please join us in a moment of silent prayer for all of these innocent victims. Justice Pro Se remains committed to pursuing justice and individual rights. We will continue with our purpose and goals to study, understand, and defend the U.S. Constitution, the Constitution of this state, and the inherent unalienable rights of the individuals secured thereunder, and to promote the pursuit of justice through the enlightenment and education of all American citizens on all of the issues critical to the revival and revitalization of our constitutionally limited republic. How dare you, Mr. Clinton, says to you the collective. In the Detroit Free Press, page 8A, April 24th, 1995, was a article painting militias constitutionalists, justice pro se, the John Birch Society, gun owners groups, private property activists, the Constitutional Coalition with the board, with the broad collectivist brush of groups. I will take this opportunity to correct the record for those individuals of which we meet with and are for individually meet on the second Tuesday of each month at this location. We individually meet to express our individual thoughts and individual desires to protect and defend our individual rights as sovereigns. You and I must stand four square as individuals. We do have have held these public meetings featuring individual speakers such as patriots, judges, private individuals, police officers, senators, talk show hosts, Federal Reserve and Social Security representatives, and the list goes on and on since the early 1980s, and we will continue to do so. The concept of rights and privileges of the group is an anathema to us individuals hosting this program tonight. Thank you. I will now introduce Dominic Vincentini, the program moderator for this evening. Dominic. Well, there must be something really important going on here tonight. We filled this room once and the second time, and there's a bunch of people that were turned away that didn't have tickets and couldn't get in. So do you think we should do it again sometime, maybe? Yeah. If we had any left over on the way in, you should have been handed a pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. First order of business is we want to anchor our meeting like we always do in fundamental principle. If you have it, take it out and it opened it up to page 35. Page 35, first thing I want you to do is fold the corner of the page over because the assignment is 
between this meeting and the meeting next month i want you to read this at least four times it's the declaration of independence and let's just read a part here together we'll start right off in the second paragraph this was written by thomas jefferson and it's really important stuff he says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and that among these rights are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights governments are instituted among men now that's really important because he told us several things he told us where our rights come from and he told us the purpose of government where do our rights come from do they come from president clinton do they come from the congress no. Do they come from the body of the people through a democratic process? No. And what's the purpose of government? Sure. Secure unalienable rights. Okay, the assignment, read it four times before the next meeting. And please don't leave home without it. Now I'm going to try to abbreviate everything from what we went through the first time, but there's another important thing that you were handed on the way in. You didn't get a sheet of paper, but it was a Patriot Awareness Ribbon. Everybody got one of those? No. no. Are there any more left? Uh, we had about 500. To, we probably got over 600 people. This is what it's all about. It seems like the president is trying to make the militia and patriotism and people that are concerned about their constitution and unalienable rights all a dirty word. We need to turn that around. So over the weekend, I bought three yards of woodland camo material. I cut it into strips an inch wide, 12 inches long, and made these ribbons. And the interesting thing about this ribbon is that no two are exactly alike. Unlike the solid color ribbons that represent some sort of group rights, these represent individual rights. And I've listed a few bullets to give you an idea. Patriot awareness ribbons are worn by individuals who are proud to be a patriot. Patriot awareness ribbons represent every individual's unalienable rights endowed by their creator, all of which are secured by our Constitution. Patriot awareness ribbons repudiate, repudiate the concept of group rights that are all rooted in the philosophy of socialism. Patriot awareness ribbons represent every person who has or would make the ultimate sacrifice to secure liberty for all men. Patriot awareness ribbons are intended to honor the constitutional republic that was defined and secured with blood by our founding fathers. Patriot awareness ribbons are intended to deflect the attack on patriotism and freedom coming from communist sympathizers. Patriot awareness ribbons will remain, remind elected officials and bureaucrats that all political power is inherent in the people. Patriot awareness ribbons represent the right of the people to alter or abolish governments that become destructive of their rights. Patriot awareness ribbons show that people will suffer while evils are sufferable, but a long train of abuses and usurpations will cause them to throw off such government. Wear it with pride. Okay, we have some, we have some very distinguished uh, guests with us tonight. We're going to have a, a real informal panel kind of discussion. I'm going to allow each one of them to come up here and give a, a brief uh, five minute or so introduction and then uh, get on with questions and answers. We're not going to take questions yelled out from the crowd. We've got a microphone here and we'll allow people to line up at that time to answer questions. So first uh, I'll just introduce who the, the panel is. We have uh, a medical doctor from Lansing with uh, the initial CP after his name. He likes to go uh, by Constitutional Patriot. He's the author of a, a recent author of a book called a Renegade Government USA, Dr. Tom Robinson. And the next fellow is a real familiar place, a face here at our Justice Pro Se meetings. He's a constitutional expert pro se litigant, Carl Miller. And the most wanted man in this room 
former Army intelligence counterintelligence analyst and shortwave radio host of the Intelligence Report, Mark Cornkey. We've got, we've, got another, we've got another real important uh, announcement that you have to hear regarding the show, and with that I'll introduce uh, Mark's co-host, John Stottmiller, to advise you what's going on. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, it looks like we're going to be back on the air here. By the by the way, the, uh, the uh, last guest that we had uh, on the radio program uh, was Ted Gunderson, uh, former FBI guy, 27-year uh, veteran, and uh, didn't think that things in Oklahoma were just quite right. And uh, he had a lot of friends, a lot of contacts, started asking a lot of questions, as well as everybody did. The uh, program, uh, according to WWCR, was pulled off because it was like throwing gasoline on a fire. Uh, it seemed that the uh, intelligence report uh, was inflammatory, or so they thought. Over the weekend, we discovered that there was exactly two complaint calls that went into WWCR. Uh, this is Worldwide Christian Radio, and uh, I had an opportunity to uh, speak to the people. Uh, Mark and I went out to uh, uh, Viking International out in Scottsdale. We uh, took an extra day and rented a car and drove over from uh, Palm Springs. Um, <coughs> And uh, they said that, uh, well, we'll be back on the air. And uh, when we got here tonight from the airport, uh, it looks like we'll be back on the air uh, on Galaxy 3, Channel 14 audio. I do believe this is 7.2. Uh, they changed hours on us. We'll be on from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, when uh, WWCR is going to pick us up, um, I, I think they're waiting for the embers to die out in the fire. Uh, but I don't see, uh, one of the uh, sticking points is that uh, we made a statement on the air that uh, was considered inflammatory, something like blood running in the streets, and I reviewed uh, all 10 hours of the last two weeks of the programming, uh, and guess what, we didn't say that. I think it was another talk show uh, radio host that she'll go nameless, name, un yeah, unnamed. But at any rate, um, it was a program that was right on time. If there was a problem in the country, uh, we collected the data and we put it out. Uh, we addressed such subjects at the Conference of the States, um, Oklahoma City bombing, uh, the day that that bombing took place, and I guess most of you people saw the infamous facts that was generated from our office, and Mark did it. Well, no he didn't. <laughs> FBI had some questions about that, and they went away satisfied uh, with uh, two of Mark's tapes. A copy of uh, Jack McLam's Vampire Killer 2000. <laughs> and a pocket constitution. <laughs> But at any rate, uh, at any rate, uh, it was it, it was a good show. It was a good format. Uh, we were able, people were able to send us over information, and uh, when we'd verify it, uh, we'd put it on the air. That was the way for people to uh, stay in contact. Uh, I like what George Will said a couple of weeks ago on uh, Brinkley's uh, Sunday program. I don't even know the name of it. He said that the uh, the liberals have CBS and NBC and CNN and the papers and this, that, and the other, and the, uh, gee, the extremist uh, or the conservative, however they're painted now, I don't know, let's check the, the paper tomorrow, but the only thing they had is talk radio. And there's, there's a reason for that, because it's interactive, it's live, it's not edited, it's not cut, it is spontaneous. And the nice thing about radio is you have to listen. You have to discern with your ears, you have to digest what you're hearing between your ears and your gray matter, your brain basket, and you have to make up your own mind. Uh, it's not a sound bite. It's on every day. You get to listen to it, listen to the information. And I liked what one person said to me, called me at the office last week in the heat of the, uh, the FBI and the uh, satellite trucks and everything else. He said, I'll tell you what, he says, I've got an eight inch file. And he says, what I did was set out to disprove this, what you guys are talking about. And he said, most of my information come, came in the way of 
federal documents themselves out of the federal register. And he said to me, he says, how do I join the militias? <laughs> So, at any rate, uh, looks like we'll be back on the air soon. Uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the people that own WWCR have uh, seen that, uh, I don't want to say that uh, they're interested in money, but I'll tell you one thing about WWCR. Uh, two years ago, April 19th, uh, this was a medium that was being used to get the facts out on Waco, and mysteriously they were burned out. So I don't, uh, I don't imagine uh, that I can fault them too much for being cautious. But we assure WWCR that we're going to be back, and we're going to be bigger, and we're going to be better than ever. So this program will be used and continue, we will continue to use it as a conduit. It's not our program. We just sit there and, and collect all this stuff. It was the people's program. That's what the whole point of it was. And people didn't understand. I mean, we, Use the philosophy Mark taught me very well, keep it simple, stupid, <laughs> kiss. Uh, we were able to do that program. Viking International sponsored it. Uh, WWCR uh, broadcasted from Nashville, Tennessee. We used the uh, office of facility over in uh, Augusta. And uh, we didn't spend any money on it. People would send in contributions. Viking International would uh, would plug their gold and silver, which they have been doing real well with now, because uh, people you know, <laughs> people understand something real funny is happening with the money, you know. So uh, it, w it was a, it was a good combination, and uh, it's going to be back. Well, I'm out of things to say. So thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Okay, I uh, got a report. This isn't something that I heard myself, but perhaps when you were driving in or waiting around for, for this session, you heard some reports on radio. First, I'd like to thank uh, Livonia's Finest for providing the service <laughs> for us here tonight. Yeah. This was reported uh, over the radio, and you know how media reports things, so maybe the mayor of, mayor of Livonia really didn't say this, or really didn't mean it, but the way they made it sound was something like this. Got it. It was the mayor talking. The, the mayor of uh, Livonia. The way they made it sound was something like this. He wished we weren't here this evening, but there isn't anything he could do about it. <laughs> Not only that, He's sick and tired of anti-government groups holding meetings in government facilities. Excuse me, who paid for this? He feels, get this, he feels these anti-government groups are abusing their constitutional rights. Now, if he'd have come here tonight and read the Declaration of Independence with us, he'd know we don't have constitutional rights. We have unalienable rights, and maybe he could better serve uh, his job in upholding the Constitution. Anyway, we're going to get going right away. We'll have, oh, uh, we have another uh, piece of business to take care of. Uh, if you'd like uh, the meetings, you like what you hear, and you want to help us out a little bit, uh, drop something in the donation box. There's two of them that will be going around. Um, we're going to have, like I said, brief uh, introductory statements uh, from our panel, and then we'll open it up to questions. So I'd like to invite up first Mark Kornke. This is the second test of the Patriot Broadcasting Network here, and this is a test for all of you in Michigan. Good evening. Good evening. We didn't have to do that twice, did we? Good. Well, first of all, contrary to popular belief, we are still alive, as you can see. There was no plane crash between here and Palm Springs. Uh, I was reported during the break that all kinds of fascinating things, not yet anyway, uh, that all kinds of fascinating things were said about the Palm Springs meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, we have found that in California we have some of the finest hosts in the nation there, and that we had no problems at all. We had about a thousand people in attendance. Everybody was very cordial. Everybody was very uh, straightforward with regard to their activities, just as you're sitting here now. They were very polite. Uh, in fact, the law enforcement officers said the only people that were the problem were the media. 
as we all know. <laughs> Who were trampling flowers, trying to push people into pools and many other things that you can possibly imagine would take place trying to get in when uh, basically we want to keep them outside. They could come in provided they uh, were, were peaceable and they're having a bit of a difficulty trying to do that I imagine. Uh, the meeting went very well and we had several different speakers in attendance from different parts of the United States and again it went very well because it demonstrated to many people who had not been to a Patriot meeting before exactly what we're all about. And in fact they were excited about the situation that took place. When we were done people were talking to each other. That's the challenge of the Patriot movement is to get up off your hind end, shut off all of the other devices, get out there and educate yourself and that's what these men have been doing, the, our colleagues here tonight, when you've been doing, many of you that are out there, and the success rate has been phenomenal. We have had, we have had actions both in the courts and in, legisl in the legislature that have definitely put a break to the New World Order. Now to qualify the New World Order, by the way, <laughs> since I'm a crazy custodian from the University of Michigan, don't you know? <laughs> Anybody who knows what I do for a living will know, including my staff, the people who work with me and work for me at, at work, this has helped me a lot there, ladies and gentlemen. Some of the <laughs> truth in reporting is very important, but especially when you got about 40 or 50 people you work with on a daily basis and they're laughing while I'm gone. Oh, oh how's the custodian, you know? <laughs> well, we got back to work and there are people that I've talked to for years that have heard bits and pieces, but finally what has happened is it's awakened them. They've actually had a chance to see how things really do function and what really does happen out there. And uh, when you have a guy twice my size with a beard, balding with glasses, and somebody runs up to him and says, are you Mark Cornkey? <laughs> they finally realize that, yeah, I guess the press really doesn't know what's going on. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, I've been ribbed ever since whenever I'm back at work. Unfortunately, as we know, we haven't spent a whole lot of time at work. Uh, we have continued with our program as originally discussed. Uh, we've got a lot of things that are scheduled for the future. As you know, we never spend any time at home on the weekends. In fact, uh, only in the last month that we actually had some time to spend with the family. Most of the time, fortunately, my wife puts up with the fact, and I'm glad I found her, or she found me, depending on how we look at that, uh, from perspective. Uh, she's put up with a great deal. Needless to say, the parade and menagerie that was in the front yard was uh, a good enough reason not to be home that weekend, as you all know. So we didn't get a chance to spend time at home the way we'd like. But while we've been traveling, one of the pieces we got here, and this came from Oklahoma City. This is from the Oklahoma House of Representatives. And for those of you who are called crazy for saying there's a new world order or that we really don't understand what it means, I imagine that maybe an official document would help out to demonstrate that we're not the only crazy people out there. This is the Oklahoma House of Representatives anti-new world order resolution. It was enrolled House Resolution number 1047. It was sponsored by Monks, Adair, Apple, Breckenridge, Caldwell, and virtually 30 to 40 other individuals. There were others that signed on afterwards. It was signed by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, received by the Office of the Secretary of State this 29th day of March, 1994, at 1.29 o'clock p.m. In which it states, whereas, and I'll, I'm only going to read some lines of this because I don't want to take up too much time, whereas there is no popular support for the establishment of a new world order or world sovereignty of any kind either under the United Nations or under any world body in any form of global government and whereas global government would mean the destruction of our constitution and corruption of the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, our freedom and our way of life, etc., etc. What this is is a, de a declaration stating, stating cease and desist. And again, to make sure everybody knows this, enrolled House Resolution number 1047 with the state of Oklahoma in the House of Representatives. <coughs> These are the types of successes that the Patriot Movement has had, ladies and gentlemen, around the nation. One of the things that I asked is, again here, how many times have you heard us say, not reaction, but response? How many times have we declared to use common sense and to think through your actions so that we do not waste resources time and time again? In fact, we have done everything we can to ensure that we tread carefully through the minefields and the barbed wire that lay before us. And trust me, the New World Order has done just exactly that. But we have an opportunity because right now, well, even if it's in a derogatory fashion, the American people know that a few of us cra crazy custodians are out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, now, by the way, the term custodian is not inappropriate because we are all custodians of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Yeah. All of us.
and every one of us, by the way, has a right to it, a right to, to the protection. In fact, it is a God-given right that's been demonstrated here tonight and will be demonstrated again during the questions that are asked. We have, though, a very dangerous time ahead of us, and I will say this, and I will not back down, for instance, on the militia and the fact that we need the militia now. The militia at large is an absolute necessity because it is part of the checks and balances that were put in place. One of our last liberty teeth that would probably survive before tyranny would reign in this nation. We must be well-rounded patriots. What that means is most assuredly we must be involved in government at all levels, and yes, you must vote. We as Christians also, although we may be from any other denomination, any other religion, have an obligation to try and find a peaceable solution to the problems that sit before us. But we also understand that men can be very evil. And for that reason, we may, if, if need be, have to protect physically our lives, our posterity, and our future, ladies and gentlemen. If you will not do it, a mercenary, a mercenary will not do a better job than you. In fact, eventually he will realize that you have no faith or trust in your own, in your own system and may decide to cast it away for you when the time comes. Well, we sit at a time with a, ter a terrible storm before us. And in fact, as several gentlemen agreed, and I would say this, you as Americans now sit at the crossroads of the nation. For the first time in probably 200 plus years, this is the time to stand up and be an American, to decide whether or not you'll be free or a slave, to decide whether or not your future shall be in the hands of somebody else with a leash around your neck, or whether or not we will maintain chains upon the thing called government, that we might have good government. Not that we are anti-government, that we shall have people that govern instead of rule that we shall have justice tempered with mercy, that we as Americans shall prosper under a free nation with liberty and, yes, freedom for all of us. This is the time of our choosing. It's not Mark that's going to decide it. It's not any of these good men that are here. It is you. And I challenge people in Palm Springs to that this weekend and for as long as I've talked. It is time to make the decision now. It is time for you to stand up, not just us. Thank you. We received a, a dare this weekend from Michigan State, from President Clinton. And dare, as I recall it, is an acronym. I believe it stands for Don't Acquiesce, Resist the Enemy. And here's what I dare you to do. I dare you to oppose the notion that people who want to keep what they earn are greedy, but people who want what they didn't earn are needy, and people who facilitate the theft like Clinton are compassionate. <laughs> Don't fall for it. And next, I'll introduce a familiar face, the bulldog of pro se litigation, <laughs> Carl Miller. Good evening, folks. It's at my absolute pleasure, as always, to come and chat with you. And uh, tonight is no exception. I, I appreciate your kindness and uh, offering me the opportunity. I basically, as always, like to talk about the Constitution. I kind of wear it out, but I bear with me. I'm going for the least knowledgeable person in the room. I, all, I don't leave home without him. I got all over. <laughs> so if you need one, you come up. We'll make sure you get one, okay? The bottom line is this book here is the most valuable book in your whole life. It never ceases to amaze me. When we go down to the law library and we have classes where we take folks down to the law library and we show them how to use the law library and... I hold up this little book and I say, now you see this little book? And by then they're looking at all these walls and walls of books. And I said, by the way, there's three floors to this place. And they go, you got to be kidding me. I got to know all that stuff. And I said, no, you just got to know what's in this book. This one controls all those books. <laughs> okay. Every one of those books in that law library is controlled by this little book. So if you know what's in this little book, you got a shot at at least getting a start in the door. So we stress highly that you go out and get one of these books, that you try it to the best of your ability to commit it to memory, such that when you are confronted with an opportunity, and that's what I call it, an opportunity to demonstrate that you love your country and its constitutional form of government, and you're able to rattle this thing off like a machine gun, you just pop right up and tell them, hey, this is the Constitution, this is the law of land. I kind of hope that you'd uh, honor it. You did swear an oath of office to uphold it. In case you folks never saw what an oath of office looks like, I'm going to show you one. They're really quite unique. It's even interesting when you go down and ask for one. They, they want to tell you a what? 
You tell them an oath of office, man. <laughs> Haven't you ever seen one of them? I had one right here. Anyway, it's a little piece of paper. Right here, Dad. That's what they look like right there. Oops. That's what they look like right there. For those of you who've never seen an oath of office, that's what one looks like. You can get one at the local county seat. All you got to do is walk down there and ask one of them folks to go to work for a few minutes and hope they ain't upset about that. <laughs> Because that's what happened the day we got this one. The guy was upset. <laughs> I says, pal, if you don't like your job, quit. But don't get in my face because I asked you to do something because, you know, you did kind of volunteer. So you know what happens when you volunteer. The bottom line is, folks, this Constitution is the supreme law of the land. This oath of office, every officer of government swears on this oath that I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and if he's a state employee and the constitution of the state. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of, in this case, it was a 36th district court judge, according to the best of my ability, so help me God. Now, recently they've taken out that so help me God, but we all know if it wasn't for God, you guys wouldn't be even breathing, so it's a waste of time to talk about so help me God. But sometimes you can let these people understand. This oath in an open court of law is binding. Our forefathers had an idea. The rights come from God, folks, but being reasonable men that they were, they put it down on paper so that we'd all have an understanding of where we were at. And of course, that's what this book does. It secures these rights, okay? Now the reality is, the forefathers were smart enough to realize that without this oath of office, this book was worthless. Because if they weren't willing to uphold it and swear to uphold it, this is just more writing, okay? Now, part of the problem, as you all well know, who have ridden horses, if you get on that horse and you don't got your knees set right and you don't sit on that saddle just right and you don't hold them reins just right, you're going for a hell of a ride. You're probably going to get introduced to all of the low, low flying trees and the low, the low fence gates and everything else because that horse is going to take you for a ride. And that's kind of what we got here with this government. They're taking us for a ride. And what we've got to do, we've got to set up in that saddle, we've got to get our knees set, get our teeth gritted just right, hold them reins just right, and let that horse know who's driving this cart. Okay? That's, that's our burden. We haven't done that as thoroughly as we would like to. Now, all of you who've ever been in a bar and seen a bar brawl know one thing happens. If one bouncer comes out and says, pal, you're out of here, you know, you're drunk, you're, you're out of here, almost always there's a fight. Why? Because that guy isn't leaving without a fight. That's what he wants. But if eight big guys come out and say, I'm sorry, sir, we're going to have to ask you to leave. It's been enjoyable, but why don't you come back when you're feeling a little better and we'll work things out, okay? Hey, no problem. Now, what I want you guys to do is become the bouncers. I want you to all get a hold of one of these books and stand up holding this book and say, I'm sorry, sir, we're going to have to ask you to leave if you're not going to follow this book. And if we all do it at the same time, It'll be done in a peaceful, rational manner. We don't espouse any violence. As a matter of fact, we deplore it. Violence begets violence, 10 times 10. It comes right out of the Bible. <coughs> violence is an act of lack of communication. It is a point at which people realize, there ain't no use talking to you anymore unless I got a four by four in my hand, okay? Obviously, there is no communication. And without communication, we can't get these thoughts across. Them. And we want everybody to get these thoughts. We want you to get one of these constitutions, share it with your neighbor, share it with your friend, your family, whatever. And let's get up to speed on this. I give them out to law enforcement officers, especially if they arrest me. <laughs> it's always fun to look at the look on their face when I hand them a constitution. The bottom line is this. They put that badge on every day, and you have to respect that. They put that badge on, and they risk their life. Okay? They ought to at least know what the hell they risk their life for, right? And they ought to be risking their life for this book. Same with our soldiers and everything else, okay? So it's our burden to get this book everywhere, to make sure that we get back on track, that we get the big picture in a plan view, and that we start understanding that when they put out top secret documents like this book here, Silent Weapons for Silent Wars, and they start talking about math modeling all of society, and they want to put us down, and they want to call us beasts of burden and stake on the table, in 1954, there was an issue of primary concern. 
Although the so-called moral issues were raised in view of the law of natural selection, it was agreed that a nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than the animals who do not have any intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stake on the table by choice and consent. This was written, folks, in 1948 at Harvard University. And it was done for the Rockefeller Foundation. And the closing argument is on this. Those who will not use their brains are no better than those who have no brains. And so this mindless school of jellyfish father, mother, son, and daughter become useful beasts of burden and trainers of the same. Now, <laughs> I can't think of anything as unchristian as that. I can't think of anything as unridiculous as these kind of documents getting filed before our Congress. This one here is designed to shut down your Fourth Amendment right to be free, to have the right to have a warrant when you get searched. This is an act of treason you're looking at here, folks. Title 18, United States Code, Section 2381 is clear and specific. It says, in the presence of two witnesses, the same overt actor in an open court of law, he who shall fail to timely move and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States shall be subject to the charge of capital felony treason. Upon conviction, he can be taken by the posse to the nearest busiest intersection and at high noon hung by the neck until dead. That's how serious our forefathers felt about this oath. Now, we got to get back to basics, folks. We got to start listening to folks and we got to start figuring out what the hell is going on here. We got to start figuring out who the bad guys are, okay? We got to start getting educated. The Unseen Hand, an excellent book by Ralph Epperson, all right? You need to pay attention about what's going on here with your one world government. They got Kermit the Frog right here working with the United Nations here to produce this book. And this book goes to our toddlers. This is a three-year-old, four-year-old toddler book, folks. How everyone should just want to belong to the United Nations for peace. Okay? They also stand for this, folks, right here. And on the back of this little card, it says, The bearer of this card has essential duties for the United Nations. Request full assistance and unrestricted movement be afforded to the person to whom this card is issued. The person is duly authorized by the UN General Assembly to employ any means necessary for the settlement of disputes and the maintenance of world peace. This includes, but not as limited to, a, the complete authority to assert absolute jurisdiction over all nations and peoples of the earth, sovereignty, the laws of nations, and unalienable rights, notwithstanding. In other words, they're saying to hell with your constitution. We can implement global population control measures. I mean, the effect of enforcing programs to achieve a permanent state of general and complete disarmament worldwide. I mean, you folks got to start getting on the track here. Now, the media is not informing you like they should, and that's unfortunate because our forefathers said that the free press was supposed to be the guardian, the guardian of our liberty. In other words, eternal vigilance is the price of freedom, okay? We need to get back to basics. You need to get educated and up to speed. We've got to move on tonight, folks. We've got so much to cover in such a short period of time. I'm going to let you go. We'll get back to you. God bless you. Thank you for coming down tonight. Get a hold of one of these books. Don't leave home without it. It's better than your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Okay, we're going to get right on. What I'd like to do is by 10 o'clock open it up for questions. We'll have a microphone in, in the back, a uh, line up there, and we'll only take questions uh, at the mic. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce constitutional patriot and author of Renegade Government USA, Tom Robinson, CP. Thank you. I've just been told we have uh, we're going to have the questions at 10 o'clock. That means I got five minutes, four minutes. Uh, when Carl, when uh, Dominic introduced me, he said I like to call myself a constitutional patriot. Well, I spent some 15 years earning a degree in medicine and getting a, getting a certification in surgery, and uh, I do have an MD degree. But I have spent the last nine years uh, arming myself with knowledge about our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, our Coinage Act, and our pertinent history, real history. And I think I've earned the title of Constitutional Patriot, and I differ with him. I don't call myself a Constitutional Patriot. I am a Constitutional right. Patriot. Before we start, since I don't have but a short time, I, w I was going to talk about some things, but I think what I better do is read a couple of things right quick, because I can read those. I think I can get those in in time. 
I, th I hate to do this again. We read this to the first group, and that's uh, to make you aware of why your media is, media is the way they are. Uh, as we all know, that uh, we don't get the truth from the media, and we're not supposed to. This is a uh, toast that was given by John Swinton, who was uh, editor-in-chief of the New York Times for some 20 years, and he was recognized by his peers as the dean of journalism. And as a matter of fact, for years, that's how he was designated, the dean of journalism. And he was very well respected. Well, in 1953, they had a toast for the journalists around the country. I'm sorry, they had a... Uh, uh, he was giving a toast, they were having a meeting, the New York Press was having a meeting for the uh, journalists around the country, and they were in attendance from all over. And he was asked to give a toast. He was just retiring, John Swinton. And here's what he had to say. They got the surprise of their lives on this one. Incidentally, this never appeared in print. There is no such thing at this date of the world's history in America as an independent press. You know it. And I know it. Understand now, he's talking to journalists from all over the country, and nobody disputes him. There is not one of you who dares to write your honest opinions, and if you did, you know beforehand that it would never appear in print. How's that sound? I am, I am paid weekly for keeping my honest opinions out of the paper I am connected with. Others of you are paid similar salaries for similar things, and any of you who would be so foolish as to write honest opinions would be out on the street looking for a jo another job. If I allowed my honest opinions to appear in my paper, one issue of my paper, before 24 hours, my occupation would be gone. The business of the journalist is to destroy the truth, to lie outright, to pervert, to vilify, to fawn at the feet of mammon, money, and to sell his country and his race for his daily bread. Can you understand why this never appeared in print? You know it and I know it. And what folly is this toasting an independent press? We are the tools and vassals of rich men behind the scenes. We are the jumping jacks. They pull the strings and we dance. Our talents, our possibilities, and our lives are all the property of, a property of other men. We are intellectual prostitutes. How do you like that? Yeah. Well, we're controlled in this country by government uh, through the courts. We have to recognize that everything that they do to us, they do it through the courts. That's how they force us to acquiesce to everything they want. Well, we got to understand that we, we're supposed to be in control of our courts. And the only reason we're not in control of our courts is that we were divested of the information that we needed to know what we were supposed to be doing when we sit in juries. You see, in our republic, we have three votes. We have one vote which we cast when we go to the ballot. We have a second vote which we cast when we sit on petted or grand juries. Incidentally, we don't even have petted juries anymore because our government eliminated those. That third vote that we have is when we sit on jury, trial juries. And with that one vote, you have more power than the president. You have more power than Congress or the Supreme Court. Because one juror can make the difference, can stop any of government's laws, can, he can protect the citizen. And that's basically what was intended from the very beginning. As a matter of fact, in 1784, when we had our first jury trial, which the Supreme Court conducted, Chief John Jay, uh, Chief Justice John Jay, who was our first Chief Justice, incidentally, charged that jury. He explained to them what they were supposed to do. And here's basically what the jurors we're supposed to do it, and it's found in this juror's creed. I will let the juror's creed, and incidentally, don't call jurors jurors, call those people juror judges. I think if we do that, we will recognize what we're supposed to be doing when we sit on ju juries. We're supposed to be judging these cases. Trial by jury means the jury conducts the trial, not the headmaster procedure who sits up on that thing they call a bench. He likes to call himself a judge, but in jury trial, he's not a judge. The juror's creed. I will not allow myself to be a juror judge unless I am certain that I can protect the rights of the innocent as well as proclaim the guilt of the criminal. I will remember that when I take my oath, I become a judge and the judge becomes a referee. Remember that. This man is not a judge and the last thing you should ever do is refer to this character as your honor. Call him Mr. Referee. You don't know that he's honorable. As a matter of fact, few of them are, if any. <laughs> I 
will, <coughs> excuse me, I will honor my obligation to be a judge and to judge both the law and the facts as is my right and duty. I will not allow the referee, the prosecutor, or other judge, jurors to talk me out of doing what I know to be right. This is what you're supposed to be doing when you sit on a jury. I will claim my right to interrogate the witnesses to eliminate doubt. How do you like that? Because I will not vote against the accused if I have any doubt. I will, not, I, I will always be mindful that the accused is innocent until I vote otherwise. <coughs> If I become aware that the constitutional or other rights of the accused are not being honored, I will automatically vote in favor of the accused unless I am completely satisfied that harm has truly been done to others by the accused. Doesn't that sound like it comes from the New Testament? It does to me. I will vote in favor of any defendant who is prevented from presenting me all of the evidence and testimony upon which he relies. If I become aware that the constitutional or other rights of the accused are not being honored, I will automatically vote in favor of the accused unless I'm... Oh, did I... I read that one, didn't I? Okay, excuse me. Well, <laughs> we can't... it won't hurt. Great. I will vote in favor of any defendant who is prevented from telling me why he believes I should find him not guilty. And of course, you know, the an accused is seldom allowed to say much except what the law he asks him. And if he says yes, because I... That's all. Well, how can you defend yourself if you can't tell the jury what's happening? I will vote in favor of any defendant who has not hurt others. Now we're getting down to common law as opposed to statutory law. Statutory law is man-made law. You're not bound by that unless you sign a contract. Your Declaration of Independence tells you governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And you don't consent unless you sign a contract. You sign a contract when you sign a license. You sign a contract when you take out a permit. You sign a contract, of course, when you sign a contract. What government doesn't tell you is that every time you fill out a governmental paper, you are signing a contract, whether you know it or not. So, that contract is not valid. It is invalid. You're not bound by it if you don't sign it. Now, of course, we are all subject to common law. That's the law of God, or the law of nature, or as Thomas Paine called it, the law of common sense, which has since become called the become termed the common law. Now we know what common law is. That's right versus wrong. I know that I can't walk down there and snatch his camera away from him. And she knows that he can't reach over and kiss her if she doesn't want him to. That's common law. We don't need man-made rules to tell us what's right and wrong. As a matter of fact, if we need to know what's right and wrong, let's go to our Bible. Our country was founded on the Bible. You don't believe it. <laughs> I'm sorry, we, I'm really sorry we don't have much time because there's so much that all three of us would like to share with you. But recognize this, in our country, we are supposed to be in control and we can regain control of our country without bloodshed. All we need to do is, re all we need to do is regain control of our three votes as, as re residents of this republic. And if we do that, it doesn't matter who we vote in. When he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, we get him out. And the way we get him out, we Oh, we call a grand jury or we call a petty jury if it's necessary. We vote to try him. We send him to court. And then we try him instead of government trying him. See, any time you... I'll have to read this to you. I don't care what Dominic says. <laughs> this is... <laughs> this is government's juror's oath. This is the oath that they have you take when you... Uh, go for jury duty. You and each of you do solemnly swear that you will well and truly try the cause now pending in the court and a true verdict render therein. Now that's fine. Now they slip on a joker. According to the evidence and instructions of the court, so help you God. Now you must understand, lawyers refer to the judge as the court. Now I, I'm going to read this again and wherever court comes, I'm going to say judge. Recognize whenever I say judge, it should be court. You and each of you do solemnly swear that you will well and truly try the cause now pending in the court, uh, in the court, that's correct, and a true verdict render therein, according to the evidence and instructions of the judge, so help you God. 
This is not to be taken lightly or soon forgotten. By taking your oath, you have given your word that you will reach your verdict solely upon evidence received into the record by the judge and permitted to remain and upon the judge's instructions to the law. Well, if he's going to do all that, why the hell do they need you? <laughs> you must not consider any other instructions as to the law. They don't tell you that he has no authority to instruct you at all. As a matter of fact, in 1895, in Spar versus United States, after the jurors had been nullifying all these beautiful laws that politicians have been passing, they got their heads together with the Supreme Court, quote unquote. Incidentally, the term supreme uh, is an adjective in Supreme Court, and it should not be capitalized any more than you capitalize lower court or higher court. It's simply explaining what that court is. You'll see all of your news media write it as though it's a, a proper noun, Supreme Court. It is not. Well, anyway, uh, they handed down a ruling in that case that judges no longer needed advise jurors of their rights, powers, and duties. Therein lies the reason for our total ignorance of what we're supposed to be doing when we sit on juries today. It had no immediate effect because the people who were the grown-ups and the citizens at, that, citizens at that time knew what they were supposed to be doing and they did it. But as time passed, they got a little older and the babies grew up and they became the citizens. They weren't told what they were supposed to be doing and what we have today is the ultimate result of that. And today we sit on juries, we don't have the faintest idea of what we're supposed to be doing, we just sit there and do what we're told. That isn't the way it's supposed to be. Okay, now, this so-called jurors oath objectifies a government contrived farce. Every citizen should be made aware that this fraudulent contrivance represents a blatant display of flagrant unlawful jury tampering, government jury tampering. It gives control of the trial to the referee, and that's what he is, he's not a judge, and not to the jury judges where it properly belongs. Worse still, it does not even require a pledge of the jury judge to support the Constitution of the United States of America as a required of all judicial officers by Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution. You don't even take an oath to, supply, to, to support the Constitution and you sitting on a jury. Does that sound right? It isn't, and it isn't lawful. And that oath that you take is not a lawful oath, and you are not bound by it. Okay, having said that, I'm gonna let this go. I have some of these if anybody's interested in learning some of this later. As I said, we don't have much time to give you what we have. I'd love to talk with you for about the next two hours, so would Carl, and so would <laughs> Mark. Thank you. Now, I would, I would say, I would say that Dr. Robinson really knows how to ride a horse. How about you folks? <laughs> uh, you come to the meeting next month, and Justice Pro Se will have published a juror's handbook, A Citizen's Guide to Jury Duty, printed in honor of our founder, Don Costu. That'll be available next month. And uh, with that, uh, let's open it up for questions right away, Lee. Um, I do have a question to, uh, to put forth. And we always hear about militia citing the Second Amendment, but we, fair, we rarely hear about militia members citing also Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16, and also the most important aspect, the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. Because beyond the state and federal courts being authorized by the Constitution, there are three other agencies, the land forces, the naval forces, and the militia. Why has not the militia established a court system to be co-equal with the other court systems so they can issue a warrant for arrest of Janet Reno for tie treason against... Amen. What needs to be done is some type of an organization within the militia to establish our court system so that warrants can be done, and if there's any, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, conflict, that it shall be held, um, it be it federal government, state government, or any other, that it shall be decided in the Supreme Court of the Absolutely. One of the problems that we've had in the past, and this is what needs to be corrected now, is every one of you here tonight, and all the people who were here earlier, were witnesses to what took place and what all of us said. You God only knows what's going on on television right now while you're sitting here, right? You can imagine how it was chopped. By the way, when the camera, one Channel 7 was running back there, they were shutting the camera off and turning it on at their discretion, by the way. That is typical of what's going to be seen. So I'm going to challenge all of you right now first to this. You are all witnesses tonight who must present the truth because it will not be presented otherwise. 
that's first and foremost important. <coughs> there have been many attempts to try and do just exactly this that I've identified and we've experienced over the last, last probably 20 to 30 years and the Fed or elements inside government are terrified of the thought and have done everything to crush any, eff any effort in the past to do just exactly that, to identify the idea of the grand jury, of the, of the true purpose of the grand jury, uh, the true purpose of the people's juries and how they were to be set up. And what has happened is compartmentalization. One of the fears about our program is the fact that we were going beyond regional control. Most everything that you see in the media, and we've shown this time and again personally, ladies and gentlemen, is very well controlled indeed. And in fact, there are things that we've seen out west you've never heard of for a reason. They couldn't hide it in their regional division, in other words, where they are in the country. So they at least expressed some information on it so that you, they, could, they could come up with a cover story, so to speak. But nationally, much of what's being done is given no interest or no information whatsoever. The people aren't. What we need to do to address this issue is go person to person across the nation. Somebody says, oh, God, this will take forever. No, it does not, because this is a geometric expansion, and we've already, show, we've already shown you how to do this. One of the problems the New World Order crowd has had, and if you recall, I said before, patience. How many times have I told you this in meetings all over the state? Patience. We don't need to be quick. We just want to do it well. It's going to have to be done at the grassroots end. It's going to have to be done with a strong foundation. Going back to the biblical concept, ladies and gentlemen, not on a foundation of sand, but a foundation of stone. And that stone, every one of those bricks, are you again. It's going to have to be done that way or it will not be done at all because it's assuredly as much of what we said here is, is, is dust in the wind to the uh, press, you are the only people that are going to be the witnesses that can carry it from this room effectively with all the different tools that are at your disposal. We need to do this now. In fact, I guess I'll bring up the whole point. Look at what the executive is doing. How dare we stand here today and challenge the government? How dare we? Well, we'll dare any time we have to, or any time it's necessary, ladies and gentlemen. And all of you are going to have to dare it along with us, because this is the big shot. This is the one time you get. Every generation gets to choose. But the militia, and here's the thing, too. The militia is not isolated, and it is not a little group of people here off to the side that you shovel back into a drawer. The mistake that's been made is all of us are the militia. All of us. If you're between the ages of 17 and 47, you are obligated, by the way, if you're over 47, we won't discriminate. You can come along. Okay? And as our motto goes along with, the, with regard to the militia, by the way, if you're dead, don't worry. As long as rigor mortis hasn't set in, we'll still use you. And if it has, we'll put wheels on you and use you anyway. Trust me. <laughs> Yes, I just want to make a statement. I wanted to commend you very much, Mark, for even bringing out the militia. I supported it wholeheartedly when I first heard about it. I, too, wanted to confirm one thing, and you were talking about the New World Order. I know one thing that in the frame of the Constitution that the God created man, man came forth the Constitution, was to protect mankind. In the Constitution, we have created a corporation called the government. In the government, we have three bodies, legislative, judicial, and executive. They are the public servants, and we are the public master and servant relationship. But during the course of time since 1900s, the Federal Act or Federal Reserve Act came into picture. The, they turned it upside down. In fact, they have done away with God. And we became below the people we have elected. It's called democracy. Karl Marx said the same thing. The surest way to become a commie is via democracy. Christ died under the name of dem democracy when he was freed by Barabbas and he got killed instead because of the people who voted against him. And again, you're right about the New World Order, and I want to commend you very much. I'm still fighting the IRS. <laughs> They're extorting my monies. I'm sure that Lee Noel knows about it for the longest time. And again, we have crooked judges, and things need to be taken care of. Thank you very much. I'd like to address this question to uh, Carl Miller. Uh, recently, I've heard uh, about the chain gangs in, uh, I believe it was Alabama, and uh, the controversy that's being raised about it. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's a committee, the United Nations uh, Committee against, uh, against Torture, that is one of the biggest uh, fighters against the Alabama chain gang. Now, in the Constitution, what I don't understand, people say that this is uh, slavery, 
this, the amendment, the uh, 13th amendment says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime, whereas, wherefore the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist in the United States or any place subject to jurisdiction. Isn't that pretty much self-explanatory right there? Well, there's a lot of self-explanatory materials that are in the Constitution. Unfortunately, some of our leaders don't know how to read, and that's the problem. <laughs> Outcome-based education. Yeah, well, that's probably some of that in there, too. But the reality is not only does the 13th Amendment restrict their programming, so does the 8th Amendment. See, you cannot have... In the Eighth Amendment, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel or unusual punishment inflicted, okay? So in several positions, they are locked out totally from abusive programming. Now, obviously, in the areas that this is going on, there is a long history of this type of activity going way back. And, and there's a, the press and the media have whipped the people into a lather about the, the terrible crime problem that we have and they want to have something done so now they're back to the old philosophy of a deterrent effect. We'll put these guys through hell and then they'll think twice about whether or not to get uh, busted for something again. But <laughs> any psychologists that have ever done any studies on this have found clearly <laughs> all it does is make the people more desperate, number one. Number two, they, they make up their mind, next time I ain't getting caught, and they do more desperate acts, okay? So I think until we get back to uh, dealing with people in a rational fashion, realizing that some people are, they, they prey on their fellows, and those people have to be dealt with. But the reality is most people, I think, if you treat them the way you like to be treated yourself, nine times out of ten, they respond in kind. One time I had a police officer tell me, do you ever, you ever read a flashlight sideways, you know? And I said, no, sir. I said almost all the police officers I run into are exceptionally professional. I said, uh, I respect the hell out of the, the fact that they put that badge on and risk their life for their, for their, for their neighbors and their fellow uh, uh, creatures out here and that uh, they, they fully intend to uphold the law and what's right and, uh, and uh, the decent things. And I said, uh, most of the time I treat them with such great respect that I never have a problem like that. And he goes, I'm sorry, I was full of manure, you know, forget it, you know. The reality is this, if you treat people with dignity the way you would like to be treated, you don't have a responsive problem. But the reality is you are seeing a backlash coming from all of the crime reports. They are, they are creating these camps. These cam we have these camps right here in, in this area too, by the way, you should know. And you'll notice that whenever you see them, it's not called this name prison. It's called this name regional prison. And they're rather large. And they're made in a unique way so that uh, some of it's underground and some of it's above the ground. Now, we got documentation. We can verify where a lot of these facilities are. Let's just hope that we get together and get enough of us together to hold these books up so that we can hold them to a standard, okay? In the meantime, we're working on it. And hopefully you'll join us. Uh, so, um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the gentlemen up there. Uh, for standing up for what's right and everyone for coming here tonight and having the courage to stand up. Um, like Carl Miller was saying, uh, we have to concentrate on documentation and verification and not spreading uh, crazy rumors or anything like that. We have to verify everything, verify the trees and I have a stack of documents over 500 pages high uh, full of documentation. It's all from the government, it's all from government do uh, documents, uh, public law, United States Code, you have to get this to the media, and if they won't listen, just bombard them with it. Um, uh, I also would like to ask something of Mark. Um, it's something that might be interpreted as a snub, but it's not interpreted. It should not be that. Um, it's just, I want to get to the truth. I have a quote here. Um, this is not me talking, this is a quote. And I'm just going to read it, and uh, we'll go with that. Quote. We've tried to get Mark Kornke to explain the discrepancies in his identification and the fact that he was trying to feed us information through Stan Barrington and said that he was an Air Force AFOSI intelligence officer and then later said he never was. He was in Army Intelligence with a 40th Ranger Battalion, which doesn't even exist. This guy's just a fraud. And that was William Cooper of the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence speaking in November of 1994. And the question I just have for Mark, if for the record, what is the truth about your intelligence background? And if you could just give us a brief sketch, a uh, personal sketch. Yeah, we'll do this for the hundredth time. 
<laughs> okay, we'll start from the top, work our way down. From 1975 through 1977, it worked with attached services, 12 Special Forces, 131st Detachment. Some people here might have even been involved the 12th at the time. Also worked with the 40th, and yes, it did exist. It was reconfigured also. Uh, in 1977, I was recruited into U.S. Army Intelligence as an intelligence analyst. I served from, uh, went to, uh, um, excuse me, I was uh, stationed at Fort Achuca, Arizona. It was part of uh, Company D U6, where I was school trained, which is kind of rare. Normally, you just do an OJT stint as a 94B intelligence analyst. I was also cross-trained later on as a 96C counterintelligence coordinator, and I also have uh, experience and was class-trained uh, through Fifth Army as a, as a classified documents records custodian. 1983, I left service uh, with the active component and with the reserve, honorable discharge, and I worked with Op 4, Op 4 Training Command, both 2nd and 3rd Op 4, which we helped to formulate for what was Fifth Army at that time. Eventually organizing up to 10,000 personnel that rotated through Op 4 itself, we trained Army, and this is where I think the confusion is because people don't listen. We trained Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, National Guard. We worked with both the active component, reserve, and, and National Guard at any given time. Uh, at one point, we were training up anywhere from five to seven units simultaneously and worked in uh, all of what is actually Region 5 of the uh, military, including Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, where we provided aggressor forces. Uh, about 19... Uh, 1990 through 91 is when Op 4 phased out and of course it kind of overlapped with the work that we're doing now. In fact, I started this work uh, investigating what was going on back around 1988 and got cross-involved with it. Uh, Op 4 phased out uh, because of political issues inside the uh, National Guard with regard to the fact that uh, civilians and active military people were interacting on a regular basis. And from that point on, it's uh, been what we're doing here, pretty straightforward. Thank you. My question is directed largely towards Mr. Robinson because I think he is going to provide the answer I'm looking for. The, uh, to preface my question, there's, there's two uh, amendments in the Constitution I'd like to call into play. The first one is Amendment Number 3, I believe, which deals with the dissension of judicial power to the circuit and district courts. And the problem I'm having is that nowhere in there is statutory jurisdiction mentioned. The second one is the Sixth Amendment, which compels the court to answer the nature of the charge against the defendant in any court case. Nature not only includes the specifics of what you're being charged, but also the jurisdiction under which you're being charged. In a Supreme Court case called Hagins v. Levine, 413 U.S. 533, it was stated by the court that once jurisdiction is challenged, it must be proven. My question is this, why can't I get a court to answer my question of jurisdiction? I've, I've uh, submitted a motion that uh, challenges the jurisdiction in this court in the 16th district right across the street in Livonia. The best response I got was a 30-day adjournment of the case and a subsequent plea agreement. Now, the problem I'm having is that under common law, I hurt nobody, nor did I damage any property, yet they pursued a case against me. And I'm wondering, where is my flaw? Uh, you said amendment, uh, what was that first amendment you quoted? Article 3. Oh, Article 3. Article, Article 3 establishes the judiciary, of course. Uh, actually, you got a beef with the state, right? Uh, yeah, it's already dealt with, but my problem is I could not get uh, see a magistrate, a lower, I couldn't get a magistrate, a lower level judge, nor the chief judge of this court to answer my challenge of jurisdiction. When I submitted a motion, they did everything they could to keep it out of the court record. Very easy. Article 3, <coughs> excuse me, Article 3, Section 2 says, in all cases in which a state shall be a party, in all cases in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. Now that means anytime you've got a beef with the state, you don't have to go to the state courts because if you do, what you're doing is you're arguing with some people who are going to judge and they've got something to gain by judging. Hang on just one second. Do I have time for this? <laughs> I'm not being sarcastic, not really. I just had to pull Dominic's leg on that. Okay. Now, uh, 
This is a this is what's called a common law vehicular judicial notice, which you use, of course, if you to answer your question. If I if a cop doesn't want to honor this driver's license that I've given myself, and he wants to give me a ticket, that's fine. But when he gives me that ticket, I will not show up in that court. What I do is fill out this, and here's a, a portion of this will explain what you asked. Um, in all cases, as I said, in which the state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. That's Article two, 3, Section 2. Now, this is still a provision of the Constitution of the United States. It has never been changed, okay? And it means precisely what it says. That meaning and intention was made unmistakably clear, clear by Alexander, Hamil Alexander Hamilton, a member of the Constitutional Convention, which wrote the United States Constitution. And despite any so-called judicial decisions to the contrary, it is not open to fraudulent construction. In other words, they can't construe it to mean this or construe it to mean that. Okay, or interpretation. Now, Alexander Hamilton wrote the Federalist Paper Number 80, and here's what he said. The reasonableness of the agency of the national courts in cases in which the state tribunals cannot be supposed to be impartial speaks for itself. Now, if this is, and when we say state, we're talking about whether it's a city government, whether it's county government, whether it's state government, because the state incorporates these cities. So actually, they're part of the state, right? All right, that being so, the reasonableness, the reasonableness of the agency of the national courts in cases in which the state tribunals cannot be supposed to be impartial speaks for itself. No man ought certainly to be a judge in his own cause or in any cause in respect to which he has the least interest or bias. Does that make sense? This principle has no inconsiderable weight in des designating the federal courts as the proper tribunal for the determination of controversies between different states and their citizens. Anytime you've got a bitch, uh, excuse me, a beef with the state on anything, don't go into a state court. You don't have to. They don't have jurisdiction. You can go, you, what you do, you write, you challenge their jurisdiction. You see the law, you can't challenge the jurisdiction of a court because he's an office of the court. And he's... We as patriots can. Oh, absolutely. You as a, as a citizen can. You see, being an office of the court, and he gets his permission to practice from the state bar association, not his license, permission. And he takes an oath to uphold or to support the court. And any, as a matter of fact, there's a, there's a, I have it. Uh, I can't quote it to you exactly, but it says in effect, that any time there's a conflict between what he should be doing for his client and what he should be doing for his court, his first loyalty is, and his first duty is to the court. Now, what does that sound like when you're paying him? <laughs> so the whole point is you don't have to, any time there's any kind of a beef with the state and on anything, if you disagree with them, don't go into their, their courts because if you do, you're going to lose. If you're going to play poker with me or if we're going to have an argument about something and I say you owe me a hundred bucks, and you say you don't, and I say, okay, you saw you, what do you think we ought to do? And she says, well, I think you ought to be the judge. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is going to happen to your hundred bucks? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. This is... I have a second question. I have a second question. Yes, sir. Okay, you mentioned that we're all under contracts. And I've called the court's attention, 1-103 and 1-207 of the Uniform Commercial Code, which I've had magistrates try to disregard the authority of a higher entity. And when I mentioned to him that I'd sue him under 1-103, he got angry and threw me out of the court. <laughs> now, why was that? You were his well, to begin with, you can repudiate a contract. You see, a contract has to be signed willingly and knowingly. I did that. Okay. Well, if you repudiate, he still won't do anything. Or if he still won't, uh, here's his end of the bargain. Sue that sucker under Title 42. That's exactly what it's for. It says every person who under color of any regulation, statute, law, custom, or usage of any state or territory subjects or causes to be subjected any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and laws shall be sub I'm sorry, shall be liable to the party injured in an action at law, suit in equity, or other proper proceeding for redress. I don't think you can misinterpret that. Is that, is that specifically 1983 that you're calling? 1983. You throw all that. 1983, 1985, and 1986. Okay. I'm involved with the Pro Se group from Lansing, specifically Doug McPherson, and we've got a number of cases that we're doing that to a number of judges, but that's Lansing. I'm over here in Westland, and I'm pretty much a lone wolf. I'm trying to handle my own case. Now, I've, I've had a bit of success. I took the plea agreement and took a partial win. The problem is that next time this happens, and because they want to hold us under contract, I'm sure I'll be back. Uh, I want to be more successful next time. 
Well, understand. I'm sorry. Understand. This is federal law we're talking about. What you do is file this in federal court. Carl can tell you more about that. Carl has an approach that he uh, kicks butt in court. I have the approach, I kick butt before they come to court. In other words, I keep you from going to court in the first place. And I... That's what I tried with the police officers, but they wouldn't, they thought I was combative and argumentative and all that sort of thing, so I just thought I'd talk to somebody that knows a little well, bit more. Well, you do have recourse, as I said. What you do is send a judicial notice to the court challenging their jurisdiction. Uh -huh. Once you challenge their jurisdiction, if they proceed, they proceed at their own peril. Am I right, Carl? Thank you. Thank you, sir. To the last gentleman that spoke, if you if you received a civil infraction from the officer for arguing all these points, did he put down on your ticket that you had a major attitude problem? No, they dismissed the CI. <laughs> they didn't want to deal with it. What's CI? Civil infraction. Yeah, this this question is directed to you, Mark. Um, this is the fourth time you've uh, spoken before our group here at Justice Pro Se. And uh, a lot of people say that we shouldn't allow you to because possibly there might be somebody near the edge that you might be pushing over the edge to do another terrorist act. I don't agree with that, obviously, or we wouldn't be here tonight. None of us agree with that, I hope. But, uh, and others would say, well, what we need to do to prevent another Oklahoma is to put lots of money in the FBI, infiltrate a lot of organizations, including this one, Hope they're here. I'm sure. I'm sure they are. <laughs> uh, and, and, but I think you probably share the concern that I have that there may be some crazy people out there who may hear what you're saying and misinterpret it and do some crazy terrorist act. I want to prevent another Oklahoma City, and I, and I assume you do too. Is there any, what can we do? What is your recommendation? Well, that's a good start. <laughs> Well, first of all, I think anybody here, how many people here listen to our program? Anybody? Oh, very good. Thank you. So you're kind of familiar with our format, aren't you? Everybody here knows exactly what we talked about. Now, uh, a certain person who I won't name who's been on the air all the while we've been off the air talked about shoot shooting certain federal agents where? Thank you. Was that on our program? In fact, then he said the next day, if that didn't work, choose a different target lower between the legs, right? <laughs> now, that wasn't us. That was another person who stayed on the air. Now the challenge is this, see what they're doing, and again, I guess you know the old saying, when you're on target, before you get to target, usually you're taking a little flack. When you're on target, they try to shoot your hind end down. And the fact of the matter is that we were progressing, and we have continued to progress on, a spe on specific issues, and we will not divert from the target, even if there has been flack thrown up. As you can see, as I said, who is on the air, who is enough? Who isn't on the air? There's a very interesting twist here. By the way, there are other groups that make whatever we did on the air by comparison pale. Trust me. The fact of the matter is, though, we have talked about making sure that when whatever you are involved in, find the facts, challenge us, do whatever you want to to try and verify or deny this. Unfortunately, as with even some of the press who were involved in one of the letters that John got was beautiful. A gentleman, as he said, went through the process of demonstrating how he was going to show that we were absolutely wrong. And by the time he was done, he really didn't know what to do with himself, and now he wants to join the militia. And that's typically the case. And what I will say is this. It makes no difference how hard we try. If there is somebody who is either going to be coerced, and I have a question, too, about there's a consideration that Mr. McVeigh, if he is the perpetrator, may have been a patsy in some way, the old Lee Harvey Oswald syndrome, there is not a whole lot you're going to do to, to control absolute individual actions. And I'd like to see somebody here who can guarantee any organization that way. Please raise your hand if you've got a formula. I'd like to hear it. I'll give you the best example. Uh, we just had an incident here in Washington, D.C. about three months ago. You might recall this. A sergeant in a police agency went into, uh, was called in for a, a, a question and answer session by five other uh, law enforcement officers, including two FBI agents. During the process of this questioning, and by the way, this sergeant had a great number of years with the force, was very experienced. The sergeant decided, even though he was a trained professional and uh, very cool under fire, etc., that obviously he was being questioned a tad too much about perhaps criminal actions. He proceeded to pull out his automatic. He killed three officers and wounded two others and then proceeded to try and leave the station. Now, this is a man in uniform, a man sworn to an oath, a man who is supposedly the professional that's supposed to carry guns instead of you and me, and there's not a darn thing that those agencies could do to guarantee his action. So again, within reason, the only thing that we can ask is this. Use common sense. 
Pay attention to what we're saying because yes, these are urgent times. I don't care what I know. We cannot back down from this issue because the facts speak for themselves. If we do not work now, then we will be in a far worse situation later. And I guess the first question I'll ask is this, who are you going to go to if the New World Order wins? If the New World Order wins, ladies and gentlemen, there is one judge, one government, one military, one, one sole mechanism. There is nobody you can appeal to. And then the other side does not have to listen ever again. And if somebody thinks there's a place to hide, I will remind you of something else. If they have the whole ball of wax, no matter how long it takes, every valley, any mountaintop, any corner, they can seek out and they can find. And when I say they, I mean whatever mechanism, whatever name they want to give for the globalists or the internationalists that take over. It's the checks and balances we have to count on. And the only thing that we can do is pray to God that people will do the right thing. And that is the best that we can do and hope because we are also still independent. I do not want to be, nor will I adopt the policies of my enemy. In no way, shape, or form do I want to be everybody else's keeper. I don't want lists of names. I don't want to know what you're doing tonight at 1145. I don't want a camera in your house or on the road. But it also means, and here's the problem, is that we have a certain amount of responsibility and we are obligated to specific actions. If you truly believe in the faith that you've espoused to, if you're Christians, or if you're Jewish, or if you're, or if you're Muslim for that matter, there are guidelines and there are specific respect that is applied to your lifestyle. You have to continue with that. We also, as we've said, and this is one thing that I noticed they've tried to avoid in the media at all, how many times have I said, we must find and attempt every peaceable solution we can before we are forced to defend ourselves. Never have we said offense, but defend. And some people have wriggled at that and even said, well, we should do something. I've said no how many times to you? And there's a reason, because, because of the very nature of who we are, because of our faith and because of our position with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, ladies and gentlemen, you do have to suffer with being in the defensive. But I will remind you of something I told the people out west and everywhere else in the country. Our oppressors, or the people who hope to destroy this country or the con and the Constitution and Bill of Rights and throw it aside, are the attackers, so they must crush and vanquish. We, as defenders, need only survive. It means that we are going to have to suffer a great number of, on of assaults. What I said earlier about minefields and also barbed wire are very true. But minefields and barbed wire only work if the enemy is able to watch all of the locations that you're going to try to infiltrate through. And that's what we're talking about here tonight. These are all the methods of attack. The Constitution is in our, is in our ballpark. The Bill of Rights is ours. All of this is our property. We've just forgotten how to use it. And I will challenge you to this. If you do not want to fight, if you do not want to have to see bloodshed, then you better redouble, triple, and quintuple your effort to find a solution, but always with an eye on the possibility that you have to defend yourself. That is an inalienable God-given right. We're going to have to look to it, or we will fail. We will fall. Please, next question. I'm sorry. I think many of us are misunderstood, and I know I've been guilty of this myself on an introduction. Uh, I just would like to state this at this time, that I love God. I love my fellow man, I love my country, and I love my constitution. And I love, I desperately love my servant, the government. But my servant's confused and physically and mentally somewhat deranged. And I pray for my servant, the government. My government needs help. So I just suggest, instead of talking to people and attacking the government directly, realize that the government can make mistakes. The government is in error. The government is wrong many times, and it needs help. But love it and serve the government, and maybe your servant, the government, will soften up a little bit. Don't attack. Oh, any comment? A little love goes a long, long way. Any comment from the panelists? Amen. <laughs> Being a uh, product of public education, maybe one of, one of you could uh, refresh us on the uh, status of the Constitution as per the War Powers Act and uh, where we're at with that and uh, whether or not it's still technically suspended in the minds of uh, some of those people that are uh, violating uh, things stated. There. There's a misconception, folks. There's a misconception. Everybody's under this War Powers Act, and, and even they are misconstrued, okay? I'm talking about the government. They assumed that they had authority to do this War Powers Act, okay? They had no such authority. Article 6, Paragraph 2 of the U.S. Constitution very clearly states 
the Constitution and the laws in pursuance thereof. Is the War Powers Act in pursuance thereof? No, sir. It suspends the Constitution. How could it possibly be pursuant? It couldn't. Then you get into the treaties. Well, they say, well, it's a treaty. We, went, we entered into a treaty. The Constitution and the laws in pursuance thereof and the treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States. What authority is that? The Constitution. Can the Constitution be circumvented by a lesser statutory anything? No. The Honorable Justice John Marshall gave the opinion of the court in the matter of Marbury v. Madison, 5 U.S. 137, 1803, and he basically said, for a lesser statutory law to come in conflict with the primary law is illogical, for certainly one must prevail, and our forefathers intended that the one that prevailed would be the Constitution. All right? Now, he further ruled that anything in conflict or repugnancy of the Constitution is null and void of law. It bears no power to enforce, no obligation to obey. It purports to settle as if it never existed. Unconstitutionality dates from the enactment of such a law, not from the date you go to court and say, that's unconstitutional. I don't have to listen to that. No courts are bound to uphold it. No citizens are bound to obey it. The matter operates in law as a mere nullity, a fiction of law. I see a number there, I see they claim there's a number there, I see they, they think they have authority, but the reality is there is no authority. So we need to correct that with everybody as soon as possible. Obviously they operate under this premise, and obviously they've, they've issued Title 22 United States Code 286A, which sets up payment schedules for officers of the fund. Who are those officers of the fund? And aren't those officers foreign officers? And guess what the original 13th Amendment said, folks? If you go serve in a foreign service against our country, you automatically lose your citizenship. And guess what it also says? You cannot come on this soil armed as a foreign agent. Because if you do, you are an enemy of the people. Now the reality is, we got to get back to basics. Like I said, you want to ride this horse or you want to fool around? If you're going to ride this horse and you want to miss all the low-flying tree limbs and the, and the gates and everything else, you're going to have to get back to basics, and there's only one way to do that. You've got to know what you're talking about, got to get one of these books, read it cover to cover, and lock their heels, and that's the only way to win, okay? There's another problem we need to make. The Tenth Amendment of the Constitution says, the power is not delegated to the United States of America by the Constitution, or prohibited by to, by to the states, or reserved to the states of the people. Now that means when the Constitution doesn't say that government has a power, it does not have that power. <coughs> Any power that it takes that it does not have is called an act of usurpation. Now one branch of government cannot confer powers upon another branch of government. This is not allowed. The War Powers Act is Congress's conferring upon the President the authority to make war. They can't do that. The Constitution only gives us the, the executive, I'm sorry, only gives the, the legislative branch of the government the power to, to, to declare war. So that the War Powers Act itself is unconstitutional because it was given to the President by the Congress. They cannot do that. That's the purpose of the separation of doctrine, the separation of uh, powers doctrine. One branch of government cannot convert powers upon another branch of government. In the first week of uh, the reportings on the Oklahoma bombing, when they had arrested um, Timothy McVeigh, on WWJ I heard just a short report, and I was going to ask you, Mark, uh, whether there was any validity to this, that uh, the way it was reported on WWJ, they said that while Timothy McVeigh was in the uh, armed services, that he had uh, had some sort of implant uh, in him, and I was wondering if there's anything that goes on in our armed services that would um, allow uh, the people who serve in these services to be somehow brainwashed or programmed to do something that um, uh, maybe they didn't have a predis or maybe they did have a predisposition, but normally wouldn't do unless they were had some sort of I implant or I mean, I, it seems I don't uh, if you could comment on that. 
I think what you're concerned with is whether or not any newer technology may have been used on the person. And again, he has made a comment to that effect, but what I understand, but here's, here's part of the difficulty what's coming out of Oklahoma City. When FEMA came in, FEMA now has representatives at the radio stations and TV stations, and they help them with their public announcements now and have been since the bombing started. I think you know what help means, right? That was part of the problem that they have been running into as part of the whole FEMA mechanism. I will say this, because this is an example, and this is only a small, and by comparison, old technology. This is one of the InfoPet chips everybody's now familiar with. In fact, I just use a biochip. This chip can be inserted and stays uh, on site with a party without being rejected by the body. But anybody who has a pen or paper, paper handy, let me give you one of the best authorities, I think, on the technology and the information right now. And this is Terry L. Cook. And again, he's a researcher. He's also uh, he's out of San Bernardino, California now. His telephone number is 619-328-1095. I'm going to give you his address. First of all, it's Terry, T-E-R-R-Y. Uh, -E L is the middle initial, last name C-O-O-K. P.O. Box 8262, San Bernardino, California, 92. Four, one, two. The reason I bring him up is because there's been a tremendous amount of good work done, not in my voice or Terry's voice or somebody else's, but the information on the present technology available using microchip, biochip, etc., that can be implanted in people. Now, I've used an argument for quite some time, and you even heard me discuss this in Justice Pro Se about the concept of mind programming. It is not that complicated. Some of you might be Korean War vets here tonight. You may recall at the end of the Korean War, several thousand U.S. military personnel and foreign military personnel served with the United Nations were repatriated to the United States but could not be released for anywhere from two to five years because they had to be deprogrammed. Now what was happening, and this is with simple, simple <coughs> chemical and pain induction modification, individuals' minds had been modified. That's over 40 years ago now, ladies and gentlemen. Since that time, we have bioengineering, we've got genetic engineering, we're looking at technologies the likes of which weren't even dreamed of back in 1950, except by a few spook and kook operations in the CIA and NSA. The Manchurian candidate, which for years was not seen by many people intentionally, was a favorite of several parties who were in both the State Department and in the Central Intelligence Agency, and there were challenges to that effect, some of the projects called MK Ultra, etc. I personally believe that, in fact, with an open mind, there's no doubt that there is some technology out there to program people. The shooter technology that we talked about a few a year back and two years back that was so convenient. Remember how we had all these mass shooters? And when they were done, always did themselves in before they did anything, before anybody else got hold of them. And these shooters were popping up regionally. If you go back through the records, you will find that they did not appear in the same regional area twice. They would go from points of the compass across the nation. It got to the point where in the House of Representatives on C-SPAN 1, after the Dearborn shooting, ladies and gentlemen, I watched this, a representative, one man came out while he was speaking like I'm doing right now and whispered in his ear, and he looked, the representative looked at the camera and he said, I have just been informed that another one of these convenient mass shootings has just taken place. And this was even put on, this was put in the Federal Register, but this shows you that many other people were starting to ask the same question because people were looking into the background information that was available. And again, this InfoPet technology I'm showing you here is 19, actually about 1983. This is already 10 years old plus. And by comparison, this is, this is the, the difference between a horseshoe and a rubber tire on a car. That's how, how much of a variance there is in the technology. The net, the national identification card is also important uh, to tie into this. Uh, the last question, go right ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe Dominic or you can answer, Mark. Last night I just had an opportunity to hear those uh, Deborah Van Trump tape that was made to uh, Olson. If you do either of you should know about those that are circulating the telephone conversation, are they credible or is there any truth to them yet or anybody had a chance to check them out yet? Well, here's the problem we've had, and again, I will say this, as you know, as we did on the intelligence report, we'll rate it. At this time, we don't have verification because we haven't had the capability to run, to do the footwork, to identify all the parties and to verify chronologically where people were on certain dates, etc. But again, we have to keep an open mind. Uh, 
Prior to World War II, a tremendous number of activities like this took place on both sides and were kept very, very quiet and didn't see the light of day for 50 years. It is not unlikely that because of the economic situation on the planet right now, ladies and gentlemen, the G7's meeting, and they don't trust the Federal Reserve because we have too big a debt in the United States. They're talking about reformulating the money with the Deutsche Mark and the yen over top of the American dollar, and that we will be subservient. The G10 is going to be meeting also very quickly, and they're going to create a different situation. So for these type of, of government espionage activities to take place are not by any stretch of the imagination impossible. In fact, corporations have done similar. Why would you not expect governments to do the same? And they have the machinery, the resources, and the technology to do it, too. That's another problem. By the way, I wanted to mention this, and this has to do again with some of what we talked about tonight, especially with regard to uh, Oklahoma City. We know that a lot of information was sent out as disinformation, but again, a lot of you have evidence in hand right now. And I don't want to see the hands of who are satellite pirates out here, but I know, you got, <laughs> I know you've got a lot of information on hand. What we need to do is accumulate a lot of this, especially from the first two or three hours, to see what was available to different parties. I've seen a lot of it. In fact, uh, it's just kind of like the dog and pony show we had out of my house. I don't know if everybody knows the 150 yards worth of international media we had interviewing my dogs. <laughs> that, was, that was ridiculous, but the dog enjoyed it anyway. Uh, I don't know if you all caught the, the part where the one reporter was going, yes, there's, Mar there's Mark Cornky's dogs. What is it like to be Mark's fr Mark from Michigan's dog? <laughs> now, I know that's desperate, but by the way, every time while they were looking at the house, they had what we called, my, my, my cats, we used to call it the guppy bowl syndrome. We used to have a little guppy bowl by the stairs. Every once in a while, it would get overpopulated, and the guppies would jump out on their own, so the cat knew it was smart enough to sit down at the bottom of the stairs and wait for them to come out. Okay? Well, every time that I passed by the house while the media was doing this, and I did this five times, I waved. <laughs> Not a single person, even those that looked at me with dead eyes, even noticed me. Not a single person. On top of that, here's another story. I sat down, we were, we were checking with the county sheriff, and this is why we know for a fact that the press was lying through this whole thing. We talked to the press right away because I did not want to see a confrontation. Like he was asking, what can we do to alleviate things? So I went, called the sheriff. We called the different agencies, and I said, well, does anybody want to talk to me? No, nobody wants to talk to you except for the press. And other than that, uh, we don't know where they got this idea from. Well, we do. There were handlers behind the scenes in the media, ladies and gentlemen, and there are people who are playing political games. Some of them are probably attached to agencies. But I went into the local, uh, the local post right there in Dexter. It's a small place about the size of this area we're sitting in. And I'm sitting with a sheriff and a corporal just to verify yet for the 20th time, is there anybody that wants to talk to me? And this reporter from the Boston Globe comes in, and the two deputies said, don't say a word. So I said, okay. So I sat down in a chair, and the Boston Globe reporter trotted in, and he goes, I just got pictures of Mark Cornky, and I sent them to my paper, and I know all about him. And boy, have you heard anything yet? They said, no, as we told you for the last 20 times, nobody's interested in him. Well, well, well there's got to be somebody looking for him. He said, no. And so the one corporal got up, and he said, why don't you sit down right here? So I sat right next to this guy for 25 minutes, listening to him tell me all about Mark Cornky and all the things that he knew. And this poor sucker, this poor sucker, by the time he's done, he finally kept looking at me like, like, you know, kind of like, well, gee, there's something I should know here. So he went outside with the corporal, and the corporal came back and he says, Mark, I don't think you understand. I think he, f he might have an idea who you are. He's outside wetting his pants right now. <laughs> From that point on, as the, as, the, as, the, as the journalist demonstrated, the quality of coverage was yeah, pretty stupid. Like I said, the guppy bowl syndrome was terrible, as a matter of fact. And on two other occasions, eventually I just had to walk away because we were being inundated. And again, in a, one situation, I went into a store. We went to a side door, and while everybody was standing there with this dead look on their face, with a microphone in their hand and a clipboard, staring at the front door, we stepped out the side, walked into a vehicle, and drove away. Poor guy driving the truck thought, man, they're going to swamp us. I said, they don't even see us. And that was an example of the kind of coverage that we got. Now, the bad part is this. Now, I, wanna, I want you all to pay attention to something. I have seen this before. But one of the reasons that the media did this was to see if they could do grievous bodily harm to us also. Now imagine if you would be, especially with that announcement, that I am the second most wanted man in the United States. Have you thought about that? If you were a young rookie cop only a, a month out of the county lockup, because remember they keep you there for a year or two to make sure they got, you got an idea how to deal with people. 
That poor rookie cop just came out of the restaurant or the Dunkin' Donut shop, which is more likely the place we'll find him. He comes out and he sees Mark from Michigan, AKA the most wanted man in the world. What do you think could have happened? That you, thank you very much. That was designed to be reckless endangerment. Oops, I'm sorry, I won't use that official term that's gonna be bantered about later, but fact of the matter is, that these people all knew because one mistake that was made is they all called the county sheriff. The county sheriff got, was so tired of it that he did a tape recording <laughs> stating that he had called Oklahoma City, Washington DC, Detroit, Michigan, and Arbor, Michigan, and both the ATF and the FBI wherever possible, and they all said, no, we do not want to talk to Mark Kornke, period. He left the tape recording on, and every time that the news media called in, ladies and gentlemen, not only did they hear a tape recording, but it can be validated that they, all, they were all tape recorded. For three and five days, they carried on with this, and they knew it was a lie. Now, they know for a fact that the old proverbial, I won't say the other word, I'll use fingers are in the ringer, because fact of the matter is, don't, don't you think the sheriff would be more than happy considering all the nuisance calls he got to cooperate when the time comes? Most assuredly, he will. But this is a demonstration of what we have told you about time and again. And I have a problem here. If they threw all their cards into this game, ladies and gentlemen, considering that we're just a custodian, then you better wonder what's happening right now in the United States and why they deemed it so important to demonize us and to attack at this particular time. This is the most important time in the nation, not because me, because if I fall, one of you must stand up to replace me. If that person falls, one of these gentlemen or you must stand up yet again to replace him. You have the capability, you have the working knowledge. Why most assuredly we have a policy, for instance, with the way I've trained all the units I've ever trained, first of all, we're only as fast as our slowest man or woman. Second, we never leave anybody behind because we consider all of our individuals priceless and valuable. But ladies and gentlemen, if we do fall as an individual, we must be replaced because we have no choice. What I see here is a situation where, as I said, they, threw, they spent all their cards, they've thrown tremendous expense into this. Do you realize what propaganda money was involved? Do you realize how many, how many uh, chocks were pulled off underneath the tires to let the thing slide faster and how many lies were generated? You had best ask yourself, why? And it is a very cold question indeed because it demonstrates just how close we are. If you leave here tonight with one thing, it is a sense of urgency that you must act and act appropriately and act with reason, not with recklessness, but that you must act now. These men have given you solutions. This man has given you solutions and can show you what needs to be done, but don't become comfortable or complacent and lay down thinking that the paper will win. It is a demonstration to show that we are, that we are just. But just as assuredly, as I've said how many times, what is going to happen is this, as he wins a case, or as he wins a case, we come closer to confrontation because at one point, the New World Order crowd is not going to accept a pink slip. At some point, either at the township level, or the county level, or the state level, you will do so well, as we have already seen, that one way or another, they will try to push you out of the way. As I said, a lot of other people have been saying a heck of a lot worse than we have on the air. What is it that we said that was considered to be so harmful that we had to be ripped off the airwaves? True. Okay, folks, thanks everybody for coming out. I'm sorry, but it's 11 o'clock. We have to clear out. Again, I want to thank Livonia's Finest for helping us out tonight. And come back again uh, next month and uh, get your jurors handbook. Good job. By the way, everybody, McVeigh, McVeigh has been positively identified as a federal agent from the Waco, from the Waco trials. They have a federal agent that's a spitting image of McVeigh from the Waco trial. Okay, we got the documentation to prove it. When you look at it, these two guys here are federal agents. This was given a questionnaire. This is one here. When they gave it out, they gave it side view copies. Very loud. Front view copies. This is fact. Mark.